Since 2005, Blue Hat has been where the security research community and Microsoft come together as peers. To debate and discuss, share and challenge, celebrate and learn. On the Blue Hat podcast, join me, Nick Fillingham. And me, Wendy Zanoni, for conversations with researchers, responders and industry leaders, both inside and outside of Microsoft. Working to secure the planet's technology and create a safer world for all. And now, on with the Blue Hat podcast. So you're in the Microsoft Research Division, which is is a part of Kevin Scott, Microsoft's CTOs, or is, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Right. So Kevin Scott, who is our Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft, is responsible for the uh, Microsoft Research and Incubation portions of the company. So if you think about how research is aligned around the company, we have labs worldwide. Literally, we have labs in, in Redmond, we have labs on the East Coast and, and Cambridge, both Cambridges, actually. We have uh, a Silicon Valley lab, we have labs in India and in Israel. I love the folks in Israel, props to Blue Hat Israel. And, um, and even in Beijing and, and in Singapore, we've got labs. And so each one of these labs has a cadre of uh, senior researchers who are masters in their class. They have multiple doctorates in a lot of cases, and they frankly think differently, right? They, their, their entire mindset is entirely focused on the academic pursuit of that next generation innovation or that next generation technology that we haven't even thought of or imagined yet. Raul, the, the organization that you work in uh, at Microsoft, this is Microsoft Research, which is separate to Microsoft Security Response Center, MSRC. You are in Microsoft Research, which is a part of Kevin Scott, Microsoft's uh, chief technology officer. That's that's his division or that's a division underneath his organization. Did I get that right? Yes, absolutely. That's correct. So if you think about how Kevin Scott is our chief technology officer for Microsoft, and he's responsible for all the technology and research uh, that, that we have for the company, right? So across the company, we have labs worldwide. We have labs here in Redmond. We have labs in, in Silicon Valley in Cambridge, both here and in the UK. We have labs in Israel, you know, Matt props out to the Blue Hat Israel crew, as well as in uh, Beijing and, and uh, Singapore. And each one of these labs has a cadre of, of researchers who are masters in their class, right? They they are, you know, doctorates and, and computer scientists that are working on next generation stuff, things that are going to, you know, help us in the future and as they continue to do their innovations. And my role in that respect is very specifically making sure that when they ship that stuff, it's beyond reproach from a security perspective, right? So as a security officer, I'm responsible for making sure that those releases are are secured and, and protected and they meet all of our compliance objectives. And also on the other end of the spectrum, as the principal hacker, I get to go and look at these and explore them and, and play with them and figure out what could possibly go wrong. How can we avoid that from happening in the future? Or more importantly, what are the tools and controls that we don't have yet that don't exist that we need to think about today for that next horizon? So the time scale that you are working on and that your org is working on, are you focused on products that are shipping right now or are already in production? Or are you thinking about stuff that's 12, 18, 24, 36, 48 months into the future? Yeah. Um, you, you're, you're ahead, right? You're thinking about what's coming down the pike you, you know, years from now? Exactly, right. I don't deal with the old and busted. I go deal with the new hotness, right? Is I get I get the luxury uh, and privilege of of being able to think about what's on the horizon and a little bit about what that means, right? So if you think about the way Microsoft works in general, right? Every year we're going to ship product, right? And that product becomes production services or or whatever, what have you, right? And those need to be maintained and serviced and, and kept in perpetuity for our customers to go, you know, purchase and enjoy and, and run their work. In the research and technology space, it's radically different. We have what's called a horizon, right? So we're thinking of things that are 
three, four, five years out, 10 years out, things that we haven't even thought about yet, things that we only have an inkling of what might happen. And so that's where we have a lot of investment in what we call moonshots or the big bets, where we're investing in things now, today, to go and make uh, some progress in an area within the next five to 10 years. Or if we're at that point where we've seen some market traction, we've seen some differentiation in the market, we've seen something that can help us uh, disrupt or start a new era or a new arena of, of the industry. That's where we pull that forward into our incubation. And that's where they work in the shorter term, you know, 18 to 24 months. And that's really where I spend a lot of my time focused on, all right, let's go through the punch list, make sure that you're buttoned up properly. Let's make sure that you've done your threat models. Let's make sure that if you're doing AI, you're doing that responsibly. Are you handling user data? Are you handling customer data? Or are you handling enterprise data? The rules are different depending on the audience and the scope of that end user and customer context. And as researchers, they don't really get that, right? They're thinking, oh, hey, here's this new atomic bomb. Let's go play with it. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> We need to take the atomicity out. We need to take the bomb word out. We need to go and, you know, make it a little bit less uh, explosive and a little bit more consumable, right? So let's let's make it, you know, the uh, quantum spoonful of of uh, encryption or something like that. So uh, we we go from taking these grandiose ideas that we have. In a lot of cases, we don't know if we even have controls yet. To Developing that, formulating that, coming out with some clarity out of that ambiguity to help lead or differentiate ourselves in the industry. Raul, I'm assuming that the, what you're working on right now, you can't maybe specifically talk about. Maybe you can, but uh, before we get to what's coming and, and, and what you may or may not be working on, do you have an example of something that is already shipped that is already in production where you can sort of talk through that process of, you know, maybe it started in Microsoft research and yeah. then it went out to become a product or maybe it started in a sort of a product engineering team and then your group's job was to think about the tools and the the elements needed to keep it compliant and secure. Like, is there a good example you can give just for folks to sort of wrap their head around it with something that might already be in market? Yeah, there's a couple examples that the uh world, if, if they're paying attention, is probably already aware of, right? So one good example uh, that I that I like to point out is the Azure Sphere. If you're familiar with the Azure Sphere, it's quite possibly the most secure IoT device that exists on the planet today, right? It's got a secure chip, it's got a secure bootloader, it's got a secure operating system, it's got a secure cloud connection experience, it's got managed fleet capabilities, it's got a lot of really neat, juicy security innovations in a really small form factor that's actually quite powerful. Um, and when that first started a number of year ago, a number of years ago, it started off as just, hey, what if we took an Arduino and added a crypto chip to it? And I was like, okay, yeah, that's not good enough. How about we think a little bit more? And that's when they're like, well, how about this? And I discovered this paper that they already came out with these new seven principles for IoT security. And I was like, yeah, that. And so we took that idea and they developed that and they continued to incubate that all under tents, by the way. Under tents, you mean sort of confidentially? Right, to all, yeah. all confidential projects, right? Um, because we're shipping a security device, right? We didn't want to let the world know about this or leak that. and. The uh, review process when they first came to us was like, oh, yeah, we're going to do all this stuff and it's going to be super secure and we're going to do all this stuff. And I, I said, OK, let me play with it. And so what we did behind the scenes was I set up this program called Hack This Research. And I invited the research team to come and show the security community across Microsoft this new thing that they had. And it was a way to get the groundswell of security expertise across the company and to help research projects get that input on something that's going to be critical to us in security. 
So we did the first hack this research with this thing, and they did just the brown bag slash threat model around this exercise. And we had about 20 security people around the company who were pen testers and app assurance folks and, and incident responders come in and gave them a lot of good feedback over some pizza and beer, right? It was a great exercise, a nice night of everyone getting together and talking shop and, and giving them feedback. Well, the next week I talked with the team, it was like, Raul, that was amazing. We have over four and a half pages of notes of things we need to go think about and figure out now. What we want to do next is go have an open public hack of this device because we, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, when it goes out there, it's really truly unhackable. Um, and I'm like, okay, so let's run a hackathon, right? And so I partnered with the garage and said, I want to run the super secret hack that's open to people by invite only that they signed up to go and hack a new device that Microsoft's going to ship. And wouldn't you know it, I had almost 150 people sign up for that alone. And we're like, all right, the first 20 people to sign up, get this device, and they get very explicit instructions on what they need to go do. And sure enough, the first 20 people that we got were some of the best red teamers that we have in the company. They were hot on this thing. They wanted in. So we're like, all right, let's go for it. So we gave them the device and they came back with almost 150 new security bugs that we didn't even think about in the first row. And some of them went some really gnarly ones that went down into the chip and how they actually handled the chip processing and how they actually embedded the uh, circuit and how that it can actually pipe in and, and tweak the bits on the circuit boards. And God, I learned a lot from that one exercise myself, just from that hack alone in terms of what damage you can do to an IoT device. And they went about and fixed all those things. And then they put that out for an open hack. And at that open hack, they only had three open bugs come back. And all of them were already on the bug list and mitigated in the next OS release. Wow. So that was like one of the coolest, funnest experiments that we had ever done to ship a security device with the whole community, you know, participating and helping the researchers out. And here we now have Azure Sphere, which, oh, by the way, if you were at DEF CON this past year, you might have gotten a Clippy badge, which had the Azure Sphere on it that was running an Altair 8800 emulator on it as, as our uh, first ever uh, DEF CON competition, which I was also pretty excited about. That was a lot of fun. Those badges were impressive, and I'd love for us to touch on those badges yeah. a little bit more. But first, I have a question around compliance in research, and specifically areas. How do you focus on compliance? I guess it's a two-parter. How do you focus on compliance when it comes to research around certain things like AI, when there's not it's new and, and there aren't as many parameters and rules around it yet. So how, how will you find a balance between compliance and then also just allowing the product itself to evolve and then rules are created around it and so on and so forth? That's an awesome question. And I'd love to give you a straight answer, but a lot of it really comes down to it depends, right? And I love having this question because I get asked this a lot and I just say, okay, well, let me throw this out there. How do you protect the rights of a mosquito's DNA? Ooh. Right. I mean, how, do you, how of... do you protect the rights of a mosquito's DNA? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah, you heard that correctly, right? Yeah. Okay. So okay. imagine, if you will, I had a researcher come in with a project is like right at the beginning of COVID, right at the end of that. That was like right at the there was a scare about you know mosquitoes transmitting this virus throughout South America and Central America that would lead to premature births and encephalitis in babies. If you know anything about that, it's it's pretty scary and damaging to see up front. And this researcher wanted to do something good for this and wanted to really get into this. And so they invented this mosquito trap catching device. And we're going through this and we're doing the threat model and we're asking ourselves, you know, we are a software company. How do we handle a hardware device that captures insects? And, and you're not talking in euphemisms here. This no, is I'm a, not talking in euphemisms. This is a I'm physical talking device that catches mosquitoes. physical mosquitoes. Uh, yeah. Got it. Okay, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, the things that bite you and bite cattle and, and bite other animals and transmit diseases, those things, right? So they literally built a machine to catch bugs, right? 
And so you think, oh, cool, I'm catching bugs. It's, it's, it was a fun time, you know, talking about security bugs and mosquitoes and, and DNA and thinking about, all right, how do you handle the, you know, it was funny. It was like, you know, we're dealing with DNA here. We're dealing with, with what's considered, you know, blood and, and hazmat materials. There are compliance obligations around personal data and blood and DNA is actually on the sensitive uses list. So what do you imagine happens when that goes through our decision tree matrix that every division has and you say, oh yeah, you've got sensitive use over blood, but it comes from a mosquito. Hmm. What are the privacy rights for that? What are the security implications for handling DNA from mosquitoes? Because that's no longer dealing with a SQL injection or cross-site scripting, we're dealing with hazmat materials, right? We're dealing with biomaterials, biological stuff, goo, right? Because what this machine does is quite literally snags a mosquito, squishes it, and extracts the DNA to record if it has a strain of a virus, which interestingly enough, what are the rights of a virus if we identify its DNA? That's go ahead, Nick. That just gets my head spinning. Well, I just want to, like. I, quick, <laughs> quick clarification. This may not be a quick answer, but when you say the DNA rights of a mosquito, initially I thought you meant the blood of the victim. In some cases, potentially the human being that has been captured and trapped by mm -hmm. by the mosquito. So now you've got a person, a human's DNA, because you captured and squashed a mosquito. And so through, you know, you, you have this sort of secondary or sort of tertiary collection of human DNA. Right. Or were you referring to the mosquito as an entity and whether the, and the actual DNA rights to that mosquito? Wh which one is it? Is it both or is it or something else? Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> what are the rights of the virus? Because it has a DNA the, signature. So the... The rights of the virus. This is where my brain is starting to melt. Right? <laughs> Here's the thing is, none of these things are relevant because the only things we really cared about is whether the mosquito carried the DNA of the virus. And last I checked, a virus is considered malicious. So we were able to justify that out right away, right? But here's the other problem is like, what happens if someone were to go out into the field and go discover this machine? What do they do with that from a environmental rights protection agency type thing, or from a uh, surveillance perspective, people might think, oh, what are you tracking out here in the world? And those are some of the weird questions people might be looking at, right? Or asking if this stuff gets published, right? And so these are the things that we have to think about and do our due diligence and have a response for, because some of these things get crazy, like putting a data center underwater. What could possibly go wrong? It's more than just water, it's air pressure, it's removing oxygen, it's, you know, how do you deal with fluctuations in water temperature? And none of these are security related questions until you start thinking about it from a, from a physical perspective. I would assume that it's a learn as you go type thing. Like yeah. I assume compliance frameworks are constantly updated because there's like, oh wait, we didn't think about that. So that probably comes into play with things such as totally. the AI um, yep. area. Like we're getting, moving forward. It's like, oh, we didn't think of that. Cause you know, everyone's putting everything in there. They're asking all these questions, even though it does tell you, do not put any sensitive information. Do not put anything about, you know, yourself, your health, your, your personal life. But I'm sure that that is being disregarded in some sense. So then it's up to the companies to protect that data. But, you know, this is all new. So well, I yeah. could see, you know, well, we're evolving. Definitely. Absolutely. Right. It's like there's everything that we're doing now and that we're scrambling even ourselves as a company. We knew was coming. Everybody saw this coming years ago. And the reason why I know was because I was the one that let that happen with Tay, right? Guilty. When Tay happened back in 2016, I wrote a white paper and we published it and we put out there very clearly, here's what's going to happen. Here's what needs to happen. Here's where we need to go next, ladies and gentlemen, right? And now we've seen the evolution and we've seen with Bing publishing its instance of ChatGPT, my God, if half of those predictions didn't come true 
and manifested themselves in, in, in its totality in terms of the bot rampancy and, and the hallucinations and, and the resilience controls that we needed to implement in there. Those things we didn't know back in 2016, what we needed to know, right? And we've evolved and we've grown since then, and we're still growing and evolving, right? And now we're moving into this era where, hey, now we've got this AI thing that we can ship and make available to customers. And that means it's not just academic anymore. It's not just in research. Now it's the rest of the company has to go put it in their products. And this puts an entirely different set of perspectives for all of our security people. And this is the message that I'm trying to get out now, right? And I almost feel like the old man out of the woods, you know, screaming at the top of my lungs, go do this thing, right? And and some of these things are, like we said, it's, you know, it was fly by night at the beginning, but realistically, it wasn't. The one thing I've learned consistently in research is as more things change, the more things stay the same right? You still need an identity, right? You still need a platform or service, right? You still need some user experience. You still need to handle the data some way, right? These things don't change. What's changed is the user interactivity, right? So if you think about what we've done for the last 150, 200 years, it's been all keyboard and in the last 50 years, keyboard and mouse. And in the last five, 10 years, it's been touch. We've evolved now to being able to interact with our PCs with spoken word, right? And the same type of coding that you do with your three-year-old toddler when you say, go butter the bread, is the same behaviors we're seeing today with these AIs. When you ask it to go complete a basic rudimentary task, like, let's walk through this with a, with a toddler, right? I say, go butter the bread, right? It's going to go and it's going to go grab a knife and it's going to go grab the sharp knife and it's going to look at you with those eyes and it's going to pick up the eyes. You can like, no, grab the butter knife. Okay, it goes, grabs the butter knife and it goes and cuts the butter lengthwise. Or like, no, grab a pat of butter. So it cuts a little pat of butter and then it slapped the butter on there and starts rubbing it with its hand. It's like, no, use the butter knife, right? You have to be very directive. You have to be very explicit with the toddlers so that they don't end up cutting their hand open. And trust me, I know that my, my son, when he was young, did that on his own without any instruction whatsoever. So that's the thing that sort of sits in my head is these AIs are very rudimentary. They still need to be trained. They still need to be curated. And here's the fun fact, ladies and gentlemen, they're still being trained off of us. So their only reflection of how good or bad or how effective or ineffective we are in providing documentation and providing good context and providing good outputs for it to read and consume to generate outcomes. And I always say thank you after I engage with the AI. I always oh, say please yes, and thank yes, you. I love that. <laughs> Great. It, it's, it's, I love saying that joke is like, always say please and thank you now because they remember they're making kill lists and you don't want to be on it, right? <laughs> you know what? That is hilarious. When I first, I went to software engineering school and I got my first job in security and someone said, why did you choose to get into security. I said, I want to survive the singularity. I want them to keep me yeah, around. Yeah, we make great pets. <laughs> I, I would gladly. <laughs> I want to, so Raul, you, you mentioned, um, I'll come back to a, a little thing you just mentioned a minute or so ago. You talked about Tay and the Tay experiment. And I think you said guilty. Uh, were you acknowledging, uh, is that is that something that you're, you, you're sort of taking some sort of credit for that you or your team I, I don't know. What, you mentioned Tay, and I, I remember that sort of controversy, that sort of chatbot that came yeah, out and how yeah. people sort of were able to socially engineer it to essentially start to use, you know, horrible language. And, and you know, obviously that was never built into it from the beginning, but it was learning from its interactions with people and then that got abused and now yeah. it was saying horrible stuff. But that was a, quite a few years ago now. I love the fact that the world still believes that story. 
Oh, what is the real story? What are you what are you going to disclose for us here on the uh, on the Blue Hat podcast? <sighs> well, it's just between us chickens, right? So just us. Yeah, no one else uh, is listening. Nobody's listening, right? This <laughs> is totally inside internal. Nobody's going to pay attention, right? So the the real root fact of the matter was that it was a close model. There was no live dynamic interaction. There was no training on the fly. It was already pre-baked and pre-trained. Yeah, it was trained on a bad data set, but that data set wasn't what was getting exposed when we had all that damage, right? What people observed and what people were seeing was the result of a series of really good hackers that had gathered up as a wolf pack. And I had the data side by side, quite literally, of the logs that came off of Reddit and the logs on our chat bot, right? And watched us within 45 minutes of discovering the URLs had found the backend APIs and found the subscription that actually hosted the test API and discovered that test harness and were able to use the test harness to have the bot say echo and write whatever you want in it. And as part oh. of that echo, you can add an at mention. Well, unfortunately, they didn't put in a control in that at mention to only have an app mention back to the originator. So they were cool. able to app mention everyone and publish it or app mention individuals and target. And so that was a lot of the damage that we actually saw. But the world that's less I, I, that's sort of like less sophisticated. I, I thought this was I thought this was, you know, a wolf pack, but a wolf yeah. pack of basically and, and you let know, this be a lesson to the world. Teens of of you know, nope. just hammering it with with nope. with misinformation and disinformation, but it was actually a hack. It was just a plain old simple hack, and this is the lesson for the world. It doesn't matter how complex or how sophisticated your your technology is. If you don't do your basic block and tackle, it don't matter. And that's what Tay demonstrated. And that's what we've seen in some, some other examples you know, publicly is that the reason why it got exploited wasn't because it was rampant or that it did something wrong. It was that our adversaries were sophisticated enough to go figure out the threat model, figure out the data flow model, figure out the back end for the developers. It's really easy to go find the dev and test site when all you do is you put the URL and you hard code it in your comments. I mean, come on, people, it's not that hard, right? And then when you go and find that, and then you go find the API key and you find out that the API key works regardless of whether it's debug or prod, yeah, that sort of kind of gives them carte blanche to go do whatever they want. But it's a lesson learned. Yeah, I was going right. to say it's fascinating because I thought the story you were about to tell us was, you know, the sort of early examples of, you know, poisoning a machine learning model and, you know, how that could now be related to where we are with, you know, today and chat GPT-4 and all that. But it turns out that that example was was just straight up basic security blunders or some sort of process blunders. And I I, I say that absolutely having no ability to go and do this stuff myself. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah. uh, nothing but love and respect to all the, the, the people that, that built that, that experiment. Nothing but love and hug ops to them for, for going through that ordeal. But the, the key things that came out of that that I really love about that is, one, it helps shape and clarify a lot of assumptions that we had around user experiences with an avatar-based model or an AI experience. We definitely learned a heck of a lot in terms of how we as the research division needed to approach security going forward. Because let's be perfectly brutally frank and honest, that Tay incident was the first security review and threat model in all of research in its 35 years of history. Its first official compliance review, right? And I screwed that up. <laughs> and I learned a lot from that that mess up, right? And so it's 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 driven a lot of good foundational knowledge in terms of how do we look at, how do you collect the body corpus for your threat model? How do you look at the supply chain versioning for that data set? How do you look at resilience in your model? How do you introduce robustness and, and how do you adjust or adapt for bias once you discover it? More importantly, how do you manage a black swan event? Right. That was probably one of the biggest learnings that we had out of that is that when you begin your initial release, 
That needs to be an all hands on deck. Everybody needs to be aware and actively looking and monitoring the logs to adjust and tune in real time. And there's no escaping that. There's no arguing that because folks, where we're at with AI now is where we were at with trustworthy computing in 1999. Remember in 1999, there was no trustworthy computing. And we were just on the cusp of learning about Code Red and NIMDA and Slammer. And I can't remember the other ones that, that finally forced the memo. We're at that cusp right now that we can avoid making those same mistakes if we all lean in on that. And that's really where this next phase of what I'm doing is, is really all about is trying to help educate and drive the rest of the company to start thinking about, okay, what's the paradigm shift for us to now think about threat modeling and AI experience? What is the new practices we need to start thinking about in terms of responding to a bot rampancy or hallucinations in that? How do we deal with social engineering as the new SQL injection? Most of us know these terms, but we haven't really had the opportunity to practice it or even have even been exposed to it yet. And as we start implementing these new co-pilots in the enterprise, that's going to start bringing up other questions in terms of how do you protect and secure these data sets? And more importantly, the model that gets generated off that. Let me ask you, if you generate a data model off of internal confidential data, is that model and that AI considered confidential? Yes. So why aren't we protecting it like that? Was it a trick question? Am I right? It should be. So would you think it would be re appropriate to repurpose a model between different systems that aren't critical or classified the same way? No. Right. And yet we have researchers and data scientists that are doing that today. I was sort of being silly a little bit there. You know, I you don't know if you're asking rhetorical questions, but it, it feels like there are some sort of new fundamentals of machine learning and AI security that need to be either uh, ratified and then sort of disseminated through, throughout the community, or perhaps they're already there because they are, you know, just a continuation of, of you know, uh, good DevSecOps as it exists today. I don't know, but I guess my question is sort of, maybe I'll ask it like this. What guidance do you give and are you giving to security professionals, whether they're red teamers, whether they're blue teamers, whether they're responders, whether they're researchers, whether they're implementers around how to think about this coming next generation, which is, I guess, sort of here of AI and do we still need to go and determine what those new fundamentals are? Are they going to be new and we need to discover them or are they largely the same as what we currently have? So it's a, it's a little bit of both, right? So in terms of practice, right? In practice, it's largely the same. In implementation, in practicality, it means you're going to have to learn some new stuff in those same things, right? So for example, let's walk down this, right? Like when, when you do a threat model for an application today, you're thinking about the UX and the UI and how they're gonna potentially walk through that data flow. Well, now with a UX that is language-based and text and chat-based, the context is gonna be significantly different. It's gonna be based on fuzzy logic. It's gonna be based on natural language uh, conventions of declarations and imperatives statements. And how do you think about that in terms of, is this a cross-site scripting or is this a SQL injection attack or is this a cert manipulation or an RCE? No, none of those things. Yeah, those are just brass tacks for your system. But the new user interface is going to be language driven. And so we need to pull a page out of classic secu uh, social engineering concepts and sentiment uh, detection to be able to infer intent, whether it's intended, benign, or malicious in, in, in its ultimate intent. So that's one of the first things that we need to start shifting our mindset as, as, as security professionals, just in the threat modeling space alone. Secondly is making sure that we're having that responsible conversation around not anthropomorphizing these these machines, right? Because 
I don't know how to stress this enough. It's simply math giving you really good stringed together words that make enough logical sense to make you think that it's smart, right? Notice and none of that that I say that it is sentient or that it is able to learn or that it is able to reason, right? It is not human. It is not an animal. It is a machine. And even so, it can't do much more than that, right? So as security professionals, we have to inject that sense of reality so that people don't start worshiping these machines or giving them any any rights because it's math. It's an algorithm on data giving you a string of words, and you think that's smart. Nope, not, not me. It might help me uh, with my own wisdom, but that's not intelligence. It's, it's a very, very good search engine, if you will. But going beyond that, right, is now we have this concept of being able to take these words and this language, these fuzzy imperatives, these statement tasks, and go take action, right? And so how do we think about those controls for input and output, for resilience, for being able to detect good intent? Is this well within the boundaries of uh, acceptable use? Is this person have the appropriate authorization, right? How do you transfer that contextual awareness and that identity and authorization through language? So those are some of the things that we have to start thinking about collectively and being able to develop some of those new tools. And then on the other end of the spectrum is, you know, how do we deal with an incident that comes out of these models where it may have caused human harm, right? So in a traditional security space, right, we think of things in terms of, oh, they breached the system, then they stole data, or, oh, they got a foothold and they're now stealing compute, or, oh, they've gained access to the network and now they're moving laterally and, and establishing other beachheads. With an AI system, it's an entirely different set of problems. It's, can they extract the algorithm from the model? Are they able to reverse the model results to be able to identify what your data set was? And can you detect for those specific behaviors being sent to your user interface, to that chatbot, right? So for example, in each one of those cases, you know, if you're gonna steal an algorithm, you're gonna have to hit that AI a lot, right? That means that you're gonna have to start thinking of throttling. If you're asking it a whole bunch of questions down a certain path, there should be logical controls there that say, if you see these words or these categories, block or redirect, right? So those are some of the things that we need to go and invest in and discover, as well as on the other end, as how do we deal for these black swan events when we see something go way totally off the rails, right? Like we have a Tay event, or we have like some of the cases where we saw with Bing where, oh, hey, it's potentially creating a, a list of, of bad users, or it's potentially exposing user context in that data, or pulling celebrity info and, and misconstruing some content based on where the sources are. Those become real-time events that we need to treat as incidents, not just as, oh, it's a bad bot. Those are live security events, ladies and gentlemen. And those are the things that we need to go back and start doing bias tuning, building in the controls to cease and desist or, or uh, disengage models for the bot in those UXs, right? And so that iterative loop has to be really, really crisp for that initial wave as people begin to use it. And then that ongoing monitoring to be able to support that. Now that's just covering the basic block and tactic, you know, tactics, you know, for the people that are boots on the ground that have to go deal with that. But more so, if we step up one step above that from a compliance and regulation regime perspective, there needs to be some, some clarity around the rules in terms of how and when you should be using these data sets how and when you should be building a new foundational model or when you should be aggregating to an existing one how you should think about as part of your threat model and you're implementing these new user experiences in the enterprise what is the potential downstream impact of a decision that's been augmented by one of these chats right because one of the things that I that that concerns me the most is a scenario that doesn't have the human in the middle. 
where we have a bot taking action autonomously without any human intervention is a very, very dangerous AI application, in my opinion. And so as security professionals, we need to be mindful of that. We need to be thinking about that. We need to be asking ourselves and asking our service owners and operators, you know, is that really the best intent for this machine to go do at this point, to make predictive outcomes independent of any human oversight? And I would say not, right? If we're building a bot, it should be to augment the human condition, not circumvent it or, or offset it. Do we have the tools in place to be able to, uh, the processes in the tools to, f- you know, follow these threads? Like, you know, part of it is obviously putting the, the, the controls in place beforehand. But then if we haven't, and now we're looking to, you know, we're doing incident response um, and investigation, do we have the tools necessary to be able to find out if an attacker or, or an adversary has tried to manipulate, steal, poison, artificial intelligence, machine learning models, et cetera, et cetera? Or is that a new, is that a new frontier? Is that a new set of things that need to be created and, and refined? It's definitely a new frontier that's, that's you know, we're, we're learning as we go, right? And so um, I'm very much an advocate of, of open telemetry and making sure that we capture uh, both the inputs and the outcomes so that we can able better able to discern how these models come to these outcomes. We also have a number of tools to be able to go and discover how your models are are, are uh, uh, defined and, and assembled and, and what their outcomes are. So I encourage people to go and look those up as well. In the threat modeling tool, we've introduced new templates so that you can actually model some of the new things like cognitive services and open AI and the APIs that are available as part of that. Like, so if you want to build a model from AI ML and pipe that into your user experience for chat GPT, you can now build that out as a threat model and it'll help with uh, identifying some of those risks and threats. We've also introduced as part of CodeQL, some of the work that we've done in part of the Ether Working Group Committee inside of research is we've introduced new rules to be able to identify some very basic ML conditions, right? So is it using ML libraries? Are they using those ML libraries? What's the most current version of those ML libraries, whether it's Python or .NET, right? And so we're using that as at least the first layer of detection to determine who's using AI. Where are they using AI? So that way we have the baseline. And as we begin discovering these bugs and as we begin clarifying them, we now have a channel to go inject them into CodeQL under those respective tool sets. And then lastly, if you're in security and you've been living under a rock, you might have missed the note this week that we recently announced a security co-pilot that uh, our, our CDOC is, is slowly beginning to adopt um, I mean, we're, we're heavy users of Sentinel and we, we love uh, Defender for Cloud and Defender for Endpoint for all of our stuff. It's freaking phenomenal. I, I can't speak highly enough of it. But one of the biggest challenges that we have quite literally is getting applications teams to instrument their stuff, to instrument that properly so that we get the create, read, update, deletes of not just of their user scenario, but of the user accounts and what they're doing, both whether it's a user or the admin on that system. And so there are awareness gaps that we need to go and drive with engineers to make sure that we're capturing the right stuff responsibly and securing that so that we're also not irresponsibly capturing personal data when we don't need to, right? So it's it's definitely a balancing act. Raul, you mentioned DEF CON and uh, the Azure Sphere chip being on the Clippy badge. Right. I wanted to come back to that. I want to talk about badges. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, one of the, I think one of the first, you know, interactions you and I had, or one of the first times I met you, you, you had uh, maybe it wasn't the first, but a very memorable one with you was just amazing badges that you had you had built and modified be it for defcon or blue hat or 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 another security con you're a badge life guy you're a maker you're a you're you're a hacker 
can I ask what you're working on right now? Are you working on a badge for the next DEF CON? Are you working on a badge for an upcoming con? And um, what's going on? I mean, folks can't see this because obviously it's a it's an audio only podcast, but you are in your your garage workshop now. I think I see like 3D printers and CNC machines and that kind of stuff. So like what's what's going on in, in badge life for, for El Jefe to secure IT? Yeah, so the latest thing that I've got for a badge right now is potentially this crazy idea that I have for a game where depending on proximity for the badges, it will either turn red or blue, depending on how many badges are in the area and what your preference are and what you switch it to on the badge. So it's sort of kind of like a, uh, if you think about how, you know, you have uh, the these little tokens, the iPhone token thingies or the these Bluetooth LE token fobs for tracking and stuff. The idea was, you know, what if I can build some experiment around that that helps illustrate the personal area network capabilities of those things and being able to show how that could potentially do some type of groundswell and maybe some type of communication. Like if everyone's communicating that they're a blue badge or uh, communicating that they're a red badge, it's sort of like I play in the game of life, but with badges. I don't know if I follow that. So I just don't think I'm, I've heard of the game of life, but I don't know if I've ever played it. So, so I've got a bunch of people have one of these badges and they're wandering around a con and they look down at their badge and it's currently blue. Yeah, they switch it to red or blue, whatever color they want. Okay. Right. And they go into a certain room and depending on how many other people that have the badge, that room will be either a red room or a blue room. And depending on how many other badges are in the area, it could potentially flip your badge to that color. Oh, interesting. And you don't know necessarily how many people are going to be in that room or in that space. Is that, is that, um, what's right, the, where's right. the, like the trick or where's the, where's the challenge? Well, that's sort of kind of the trick, right? Is like, you know, it's a, uh, Experiment just to learn and see how people just gravitate towards each other, whether they're red or blue, and see what kind of weird things they might do to try and influence or manipulate that behavior, right? So, like, for example, at the DEF CON party, right? Everybody goes to the DEF CON party and everybody's hanging out in that room. And if you notice, people like gravitate into a couple clusters, right? There's like one cluster over here and it may be the furries and there's another cluster over here and it may be like red teamers and there's another cluster sitting in the back and they're like, you know, the people who want to stay out of the way. And then there's the people in the main middle that are all dancing and having a party and having fun. But what if even in that little area, you see the badges change color based on where they're at, who they're with or who they're hanging around with, but it's all still the same badges, right? And so it's just a matter of how does it dynamically shift based on what your preference is and what the environment is to give you that perspective in that moment in time. It, it's almost, it's almost so simple. Like I was looking for a much more complicated mechanic, but it's, it's really, it's, it's actually b beautiful in its simplicity. Right. But here's the other thing that makes it really interesting. And I love playing with this, right? Because it's like that chaotic compliance type thing, if you will. Imagine now you have a whole bunch of super highly paranoid security people that are now walking around with a badge that's tracking their location inside the conference location. And I don't know a single one of their names, but I'm tracking them. How do people react once they realize that, hey, you're tracked, but you're not being tracked, but you're being tracked? You see the, you see the dichotomy there? Right, because you would give someone this badge and maybe they know that they can set the color to red or blue. Is mm -hmm. that is that something that they would know, that they have mm -hmm. control yeah. over that? Yeah. But then they don't know how many other people have it and their badge knows some sort of degree. So their, their it knows badge what color it is right now. Right. And then it has, oh, wow, that's and super interesting. And then it changes based on where you're hanging out. Is everybody around you red or is everyone around you blue? Or are you somewhere in between on some spectrum? Again, it's goes, the simplicity. Like I'm getting caught up on the simplicity of this one. Like I'm, I'm looking so simple, for more but complexity, here's the complex but it's really question, simple. Right? Yeah. And here's why I'm thinking about this question. Why I'm thinking about this super simple, crazy idea. If you think about the way people do data consent, right? And yep. you think GDPR, you think 
the lack of American laws for protecting uh, uh, personal data. People get really caught up and all bent around the axle when a company actively takes your data and uses that for whatever purpose, right? But nobody seems to complain when somebody gives their data openly and actively for medical research. And I think there's some behavioral thing there that, and Facebook is proving that, and I think Twitter's about to learn that lesson the hard way, is that when you provide somebody something of value, they are more than willing and even graciously will give you that data if it benefits them or serves them in some way greater than what you hadn't had before. And I think that's just the classic give and take, you know, I give you this, I get this back, right? And this is essentially a play on that incentive, right? So for people who love badges, who like to play games, they're going to want to be able to leave that on and turn it on and have it track them and do that presence. For people who don't, they're going to want to turn that off or not enable that or, or not play the game. And why is that? What is it that they're not getting out of that social interaction or that ability to play that game? Because I feel that there's probably something that's tied to that when it comes to contributing data or the premise of having your data as part of a large data model. And that's one of those things that sort of kind of, you know, as a minority, as somebody who's grown up as a, a little bit disenfranchised, even in this own industry, it's sort of kind of sensitive for me. It's on a personal level to make sure that those that come after me don't suffer that same fate. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, again, like the, I was looking for the, the complexity and the mechanic. It's actually quite simple, but then the, the questions that, it, that come out of that are really very profound. And, 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 uh, yeah, you've got me thinking, wow. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is, I guess that's the goal of a good badge, right? Right. It's the technology is easy, but what's the good part about that? Right. How do we, how do we improve the human condition? How do we make this good for everyone? How do we protect us from that singularity? Which is the reason why uh, Wendy got in this industry yeah. in, in, in the first place. <laughs> right. You know, that's why in the end, it'll be my sword on the power cord. So. <laughs> well, gosh, I'm 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 glad to to have you. I hope I have you in my co- in my corner, uh, El Jefe. Thank you so much for uh, your time today and being on the Blue Hat podcast, and also being a you know a long time uh, supporter uh, of the Blue Hat conference and the Blue Hat community. And we have touched on that in a in a previous uh, experts forum, which I will link to in the show notes. Um, we have so much more we could talk about for a future episode, and we'll definitely have you back before Anytime. we let you go. You did mention at the top of the podcast, but just sort of one more time, where can folks follow along with your exploits online and or can folks get in contact with you for, for anything and, and what's the best method of doing that? Absolutely. You can find me at El Jefe de Security at infosec.exchange on Mastodon or on Twitter as El Jefe de Security. Awesome. Or you can email me at El Jefe de Security at Outlook or Gmail. Awesome. We'll also put that in the show notes, uh, as I think the El Jefe de Security uh, spelling might trip a few folks up, but uh, I, I love the play on words. Yeah. I mean, if, if if they can't find me, they probably don't need me to begin with anyways. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, Raul Rojas, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll talk to you on another episode of the Blue Hat Podcast. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thanks a lot, Nick. Thank you for joining us for the Blue Hat Podcast. If you have feedback, topic requests, or questions about this episode, please email us at bluehat at microsoft.com or message us on Twitter at MSFTBlueHat. Be sure to subscribe for more conversations and insights from security researchers and responders across the industry by visiting bluehatpodcast.com or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.